The reflection for this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, is of course based upon the readings, which is Acts chapter 2, verses 2 to 21, and John 7, verses 37 to 39. Now hopefully you've had a chance to read those for yourself, or to see the video readings. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A magician was working on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. The audience was different each week, so the magician allowed himself to do the same tricks over and over again. However, there was one problem. The captain's parrot saw the shows every week and began to understand what the magician did in every trick. Once he understood that, the parrot started shouting in the middle of the show, Look, it's not the same hat! Or, Look, he's hiding the flowers under the table! Hey! Why are all the cars at Ace of Spades? The magician was furious but couldn't do anything about it. After all, it was the captain's parrot. However, one day the ship had an accident and sank. The magician found himself floating on a piece of wood in the middle of the ocean. And of course, the parrot was by his side. They stared at each other with hate in their eyes, but they did not utter a word. This went on for several days, and after a week, the parrot finally said, OK, I give up. Where did you hide the ship? This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday in the church calendar, and is when we as Christians, in effect, celebrate the birth or the beginning of the church. That first day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in power, is recognised as the beginning, in effect, the, the starting gun of the church. So we can say quite legitimately, happy birthday, church. It was a sudden and uh, an explosive event. It appeared out of nowhere and spread like wildfire. Person after person was affected. Groups of people, families were affected and it became a global phenomenon. And no, I'm not talking about um, the coronavirus outbreak, no, it could be, it's, it wasn't some pandemic. This was a first century outbreak, an explosive outbreak and spread of something else, infectious, the truth. The truth that God the Creator so loved his creation, and in particular the crown of his creation, that is us, you and me, human beings, he so loved his creation that he came in person, in the person of Jesus, to reconcile himself to his creation, to buy back through his own death life for each of one of us. God loved us so much that his only son, Jesus, came that through his death we could have life. You see, the truth is infectious. And the truth was that now we had hope. Instead of a short life, followed by a long death, we could live forever. This is the hope that Christians have. We don't just have a, a short life and a long death, we can live forever. So what happened to this infection? Where is the outbreak of truth now? If you look at the Western world in particular, if you look at the United Kingdom, if you look at the Constant Crate Valley, what happened to this truth? What happened to this infectious hope. It's, it's almost as if the church has become like that magician on that Caribbean cruise ship. As if, according to the parrot, we have managed as a church to somehow hide something as large and conspicuous as a ship in broad daylight, as if by magic. As if we have taken this great truth, this great truth, this highly infectious good news and now kept it to ourselves and hidden from sight. However, this is not true for all the church. When I say church here, I'm talking about church big C, that is the, complete, the whole worldwide church. It's not true for, the, for all the church. Not all the church is hiding its lamp under a bushel or magically making the ship disappear. If you look outside of the Western world, so you look at, say, Africa or, or the Far East in particular, then the truth is spreading and spreading fast. There are hotspots around the world. There are outbreaks in some countries. Ironic, ironically, one of these is China, where there is a terrific growth in the church. But there, are, there is steady growth in other countries as well. 
So what is the church doing in those countries, right, that the church in the West is not doing? Well, the simple truth is that it comes down to the R number. And we all know about the R number, don't we? And we've been hearing a lot about the R number. It is down to the R number or the effective reproduction number. If you want to know the difference between a growing church and a static or dying church, then it is the R number. If the R number is above one, then the church grows. If the R number is below one, then the church dies. But what does this mean in practice? That's sort of great language, but what does this mean in practice? Well, if more than one person comes to faith through us, then the church grows. However, if less than one person or no person, no people come to faith through us or because of us, then the church dies. If we really want a worldly measure of success as a Christian, then it would be the R number, the number of people we reproduce, the number of people that come to faith through us or because of us. And our first reading for this Sunday, our reading from the book of Acts, that classic passage from the first day of Pentecost, is all about the numbers. It's all about the numbers. Because of those 11 disciples of Jesus gathered together in one place, and, and because after that bold speech by the, the, uh, the disciple Peter, 3,000 people come to faith. And we hear that in the subsequent days, in each of the days afterwards, we are later told that the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So it wasn't just the 3,000 of, of the day of Pentecost, but each day more and more were being added to their number. So those 11 disciples of Jesus had a very high R number. They were super spreaders, highly infectious and highly effective. So how does that make you feel as a Christian hearing that passage, that story? Encouraged or deflated? Inspired or defeated? Confident or inadequate? An achiever or a failure? And this is the problem for the church in the West. We actually do know that mission is important. We actually do realise that evangelism is not simply a part of our Christian walk, but it is vital to the health of the church. If the R number is less than 1.0, then it's extinction for the church in the West. We, we realise that, we know that. So maybe we think to ourselves, if only we get our evangelism courses just right, or maybe if we deliver our service to our communities in the right way, or we think to ourselves, maybe if we make our church services just that bit more interesting, then everything will be fine. People will come to faith and that our number will tick above that crucial 1.0 figure. In fact, we probably say to ourselves, if only we could be as eloquent as Peter was on that first day of Pentecost, then every day would be like Pentecost, would it not? But, and there's always a but, as you know with me, but the disciple Peter was not the crucial factor on that first day of Pentecost. It was someone else, another person who was the crucial factor. And our second reading, our Gospel reading, also speaks about this person, God, the Holy Spirit. Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. These are the words of scripture that were quoted by Jesus as he referred to the difference that the Holy Spirit would make to each of us when he came. The difference between a defeated and an ashamed and scared Peter, and a bold and confident and certain Peter. That's what the difference, when the Holy Spirit came on Peter beforehand, after the, the crucifixion, he was ashamed and he was a defeated figure. But when the Holy Spirit came, the difference for Peter was that he was bold and confident. He was a certain Peter. 
In fact, the difference for each of those 11 disciples, uh, the difference for us today when we welcome him, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the difference. But the biggest difference that the Holy Spirit brings to our hearts and to the hearts of others is not the R number, but the R word. In God's eyes, in God's economy, in God's kingdom, it's not about reproduction or the souls that you save. Um, that is actually God's mission. In fact, God knows who he's going to draw. God knows who will respond to him. It's his mission. We are called to be part of it, but it is actually his mission. In God's eyes, it's not about the R number. It's not the R number that he is looking for, but the R word, repentance. When Peter had delivered his inspiring and stirring speech, emboldened by the Holy Spirit, the crowd responded with the words, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance is the key, not reproduction. If we are repentant, then the reproduction will follow. Yes, reproduction is important because the church will become extinct without it. But it is the key is the repentance first. And on this Pentecost Sunday, uh, I do not know if, if you feel inspired by that Acts passage or somehow intimidated. I, I think it would be the, the latter. Um, you know, we ask ourselves, how come we no longer see 3,000 people coming to faith in a single day in the United Kingdom? It's intimidating, that passage. And yes, actually, it's also true that it's actually about the Holy Spirit. He will do what he will do. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit. He's, he's described like the wind. He, he blows where he wants. But And what we can actually do with the Holy Spirit when he comes and makes a difference to us is to listen to him and be obedient to him. But what we can actively do as the church and as individuals is the R word. We can repent. We can repent, of course, on behalf of ourselves, but we can also repent on behalf of our communities and our nation. We can say sorry to God. God, we've turned our back on you as a nation, but now repent, the word that means to turn around. We've turned back to you. We've turned round to you, God, and we're going to say sorry. We can then ask for God's forgiveness and for God's grace for our lives, our communities and our nations. He, once we've repented, he's forgiven us, we can ask for his blessing, his grace on us. We don't deserve it, that's why it's called grace, but we can ask for it when we've repented. And I believe that our own repentance of our, our, uh, for ourselves and on behalf of our wider communities will lead to further repentance. We, we offer a lead so that others will be convicted by the Holy Spirit and that they will then repent themselves, believe and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe that the, the R number will go about 1.0 and that Jesus' gospel, the good news of redemption and eternal life will then continue to spread. Thanks be to God.